Okay. Greetings everyone from uh, frigid Minnesota in the north part of the United States where uh, spring is just starting to come and winter is just starting to disappear. So it takes a little bit of imagination on my part to think about tropics and heat. But it's my pleasure to give you an update on the activities and progress of the World Veg Tomato Breeding Program in our collaborators. Um, I'm gonna start by giving you an update on our multiple TY fresh market tomato lines and the rationale behind that. Then I'll give you an update on our progress on our insect resistance breeding work. I'll, just, I'll spend a little time discussing our rills that uh, we developed from our heat tolerance mapping population. A little bit on high anthocyanin in tomato and then I'll wrap up with a, a brief uh, overview of our pipeline. So tomato yellow leaf curl diseases caused by bagomoviruses continue to threaten tomato production in the tropics and subtropics. Uh, resistance is really now a must have trait for any varieties that are targeted for uh, open field production. There is resistance in the form of uh, TY genes, TY1 through TY6, and many tomato breeding programs are using these genes now. These genes are more aptly described as tolerance genes because even when a variety possesses these genes, uh, they, they often do uh, take infection. So the, uh, the distinction being that uh, tolerant varieties show no or very mild symptoms, even when they are infected. So at World Veg, we use a one through six scale to assess uh, symptom severity. I think some of you may use the same scale or, or others like it. So back in 2014 to 2016, World Veg and APSA conducted a study to assess the performance of different of lines with different combinations of TY genes in different parts of Asia. So there were uh, all, uh, about 25 companies participating in this project. And in the end, we received 36 data sets uh, that were analyzable. The, uh, the conclusions were pretty straightforward in that the lack of any TY resistance was a disaster that led to very severe symptoms. Uh, most TY, single TY genes offered some protection, but the best levels of resistance were provided by those that uh, carried two TY genes. So it clearly showed there was a benefit of pyramiding TY genes. However, there were very, some very striking difference, regional differences in performance of the lines, especially in the north part of India, and to some extent in Thailand, where even those lines that carry two TY genes did develop moderate symptoms. So this led us to think that perhaps in some areas where uh, these very aggressive begomoviruses predominate, we may need to develop lines with more, even more TY genes than just the two. So in the future, I'm convinced that TY pressure is going to increase. Warmer temperatures are going to favor white flies and white fly populations. There'll be more spread of, a, of the aggressive Begamo viruses like tomato leaf curl uh, New Delhi virus or tomato yellow leaf curl Thailand virus or TYLCV. And new Begamo viruses are constantly arising through recombination and mutation. So in the long term, I think we need to think towards development of multiple TY hybrids and possibly in homozygous condition rather than in heterozygous. So this year we're offering uh, a set of uh, or 12 TY, multiple TY uh, lines that carry, uh, all of them carry TY2, TY5, and some have TY3 and some have TY3A. So they come in a, in a range, an assortment of plant habits and different fruit shapes and sizes. Um, in addition to that, um, in Southern Taiwan, uh, creamy viruses and begomo viruses tend to occur at the same time. And uh, creamy viruses, you can see they're, they're, their symptoms are a bit different and they tend to cause a very strong uh, intervenal yellowing that starts to appear when the fruits are setting and it gets stronger and stronger. This yellowing becomes stronger as the fruit mature. 
So they, uh, both Begamo viruses and Crini viruses are vectored by white flies. And last year, we had a very, very uh, strong epidemic of Crini viruses in our spring trials. And one thing that, was, that we noticed, and others did as well, is that among these uh, lines, these CLN4197 coded lines, there, were very, there was very clear segregation. There were some that developed very strong yellowing and Crini virus symptoms. Others were uh, remained green. So let, that led us to, to think that there's a possibility that there may be uh, some tolerance here. We tested the lines, or our virology group tested the lines for infection. And in fact, all of them were infected, but the green ones just didn't develop uh, symptoms. This year, we also have crini viruses. Uh, it's tomato chlorosis virus is the particular crini virus. And we've seen the same thing, that lines, uh, some of the lines remain green, and, and uh, whereas some re uh, develop very strong yellowing symptoms. So it, it, it provides more convincing evidence that besides this begamovirus resistance, these multiple TY genes, the selected ones, do offer some crinivirus tolerance. So that that's a, a, a pleasant surprise. It doesn't happen very often this way, but when it does happen, it's, 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 uh, it's nice. So durable, in, uh, durable begamovirus resistance is going to rest not only on resistance to the virus, but also resistance to the vector. So back in 2015, we initiated an insect resistance breeding program, initially targeting white flies, and then resistance, uh, our, our target expanded to other insects as well. And that work was uh, started by uh, Dr. Mohamed Raka, and he continued leading this aspect until the middle of last year when he returned to Egypt to become, uh, resume his duties as a professor. Uh, this work has a number of components or elements to it, uh, including identification of resistant sources, developing screening methods, introgressing resistance, looking for uh, mapping QTLs, and so on. We're currently working on two sources of insect resistance. Both of them are wild species, one being Solanum habricaides and the other being Solanum galapagense. In, in both types of uh, both uh, species, the resistance is mainly due to acial sugars produced by glandular trichomes in the foliage and the stems. So acial sugars act against all stages of the white flies. They increase white fly uh, adult mortality, suppress eggs and nymphs. Uh, acial sugars, it, it's a broad-based insect resistance. So it, it's not only effective against uh, white flies, it's also effective against Tuta absoluta, thrips, fruit worms, spider mites. And this is all very well established in the literature. Our current working hypothesis after after having some experience now, is that we need total acyl sugar levels of about 10 micromoles per gram to provide significant uh, resistance to the white flies. So we, we've, we've advanced the furthest with the Galapagense population, and we've, we've carried out three back crosses so far using one of our breeding lines, CLM36A2C, as the recurrent parent. And that line carries TY2, TY3, and uh, other resistances as well. So uh, the back crosses were conducted, screening was done using a combination of, of uh, no choice assays, total, total acyl sugar content assays, and looking for trichome density, uh, uh, glandular trichome densities. So our biotech group did, did a preliminary analysis, a QTL analysis of the location of the QTLs conferring resistance. And it, it's very clear that there is a major QTL on the bottom of chromosome two that uh, accounts for uh, high white fly adult mortality, for suppression of egg number, and for high densities of type four trichomes. So that's, that's a very clear uh, important QTL. 
This spring, we've grown out a population of 293 BC3 F3 plants. And these plants are all homo they're from the better map or better population. They're all homozygous for the white fly QTL and chromosome 2. And in addition, there's, uh, they're also homozygous for another QTL and chromosome 3 that Mohammed had found and, and was selecting for. And in addition, they're all, these, these plants are also homozygous for TY1, uh, TY3, and other resistances as well. So our hope was to show these plants to you when you came to the field this year, uh, but that's not gonna happen, unfortunately. Uh, what we're doing now is observing the plants for uh, horticultural traits, fruit traits, uh, fruit setting, and we're measuring the foliar total ACO sugar content on individual plants, and that was done about nine to 10 weeks after transplanting. Uh, what we found is that the mean ACL sugar level of this, of this population over uh, 293 plants was about 6.8. And that, uh, that's fairly high level. Uh, in a normal tomato, a, a cultivated tomato might have a, a, a content of about one or less micromoles per gram. So this is quite high. Um, we did find some outliers or some that had very high levels of uh, ACL sugar content. So we were, we're uh, doing another test to just to confirm those levels. One curious thing we found is that the, uh, the main fruit weight is only about 31 grams. And even, even the plant with the largest fruit was only 45 grams in weight. So that was a little bit, little bit puzzling to us as to why uh, after three back crosses, we expected more recovery of the fruit weight. And if you look at the, uh, this uh, QTL on the bottom of chromosome two, which is probably uh, white fly one, which was previ previously mapped by a, a group from Wageningen, it's very close to another QTL called fruit weight 2.2, which is a major QTL that affects fruit size, fruit weight in tomato. And uh, fruit weight 2.2 is it was a major gene involved in uh, the domestication of tomato. The mutations at that locus uh, accounted for increases in fruit size. So what's likely happening is that the, uh, the, the, the allele for small fruit weight is being carried along. It's in linkage with white fly one. So we're gonna to have to carry out another back cross and uh, select, uh, select recombinants so we can break this linkage and uh, increase fruit weight and also the, and, and carry on with the, uh, the white fly one. So it's a, in terms of uh, conclusions and next steps, uh, the QTL on chromosome two, again, is likely white fly, white fly one, which is previously published. The importance of the QTL in chromosome three needs to be confirmed. We're not sure, but clearly there are additional but unidentified QTLs present in this particular population. So our next steps are to conduct progeny tests of selected back cross three F3 uh, lines, F, F4 lines. To confirm the resistance, we'll, we'll, conduct, we'll do uh, ACL sugar analysis, no choice assays, and so on. We need to do another, an additional back cross to improve fruit weight and break the repulsion linkage with fruit weight 2.2. We need to identify lines that produce uh, levels of, uh, of, of 10 micromoles per gram acyl sugars by four weeks after sowing, because that's when uh, plants are normally, tomato plants are normally transplanted to the, to the field around four weeks. So it's important that they express uh, high levels of acyl sugars to uh, suppress uh, white flies. We're going to assess their resistance to Tuta absoluta and other insects. And we're going to continue to advance the Solanum habricaides derived resistance. This resistance is a little more difficult to work with, but we're carrying on with it. For the last four years, we've been collaborating in an EU uh, Horizon 2020 project called TomGem. And the major objective of that project is to understand heat stress effects and the, the mechanisms of fruit set under heat stress. 
So there's a number of activities involved from very basic to very applied work. Uh, the activities that are of, ma of major importance to us, major interest to us, is the mapping of QTLs conditioning pollen number, pollen viability, stigma exertion, flower number, these diff different components underlying fruit set. And then eventually to combine these, uh, these favorable QTLs by marker assisted selection. So our, our uh, contribution to the project was develop mapping populations involving different sources of heat tolerance and cross to a heat sensitive line called T-STAR. And while the mapping is going on and the identification of the QTLs is going on, we are slowly uh, evaluating the recombinant inbred lines in these mapping populations and looking for some that carry good horticultural traits that, and, and set uh, fruit. And right now we're looking at a population called Siberia with uh, Toby Star, T Star. Siberia is interesting because it's noted for having both heat and cold tolerance. So it may carry some thermo tolerance. And uh, we're, we're carrying out a, a joint uh, mapping of heat tolerance in Siberia in uh, collaboration with National Taiwan University. So some of the rills show both good, pretty good, good levels of heat tolerance and pretty decent horticultural characteristics. So some of these may be very useful as breeding stocks for trait improvements in, in your breeding programs. There's four of these in the, in the uh, PYT. Some of them are fixed for TY3 and MI. Uh, some are heterogeneous, but uh, they're quite interesting. Um, World Veg tomato breeding has always had, a, had, his, uh, had an interest in working on, on improving nut nutritional traits. So over the years, we've developed lines with uh, high beta carotene. We've worked on uh, high lycopene, high carotenoids. We've worked on high rutin content. And this year, we, we're uh, distributing a couple of lines they're showing in our PYT that have high anthocyanin content. And anthocyanins are flavonoids, they're antioxidants with health promoting properties. Now the expression of this trait in tomato is in the fruit skin. So the, the, the flesh color remains red. It's just the outside that, that, uh, that it, that's purple. And it's, the anthocyanin is very uh, affected by the light intensity. So strong light, you get higher uh, intensities of anthocyanin content. So these may be of interest to you. Um, in the United States, I'm noticing that some, uh, there's, these are very popular in gardens and, get, and considered kind of an heirloom variety. Um, we have a couple of lines in the PYT that are not exclusive and they're, they're fresh market reselections from lines that we had offered earlier. And uh, some of these are quite interesting and quite good. I would say, especially the CLN3940C has a very, very nice disease resistance package. And I think it's an improvement over earlier uh, selections from this cross. So looking ahead, next year, we're going to be re uh, distributing uh, a new batch of dual purpose lines. And a number of these carry, uh, improved bacterial wilt resistance. So we've incorporated BWR6 along with the high pigment, the crimson, and some of them carry moderate heat tolerance as well. We're working on incorporating the SW5 gene for a spotted wilt virus resistance and into a dual purpose type. We're doing a lot of work on strengthening our bacterial wilt resistance. We're doing a lot of intensive screening with different phylotypes phylotypes one and two uh, in Taiwan. And we're, 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 uh, we're also intending to map the additional resistance loci. We're, we have a lot of evidence indicating that Hawaii 7096 has additional loci beyond, besides BWR12 and BWR6. And we're hoping to map that using uh, African pathogen isolates. The work with heat tolerance continues. We're going to evaluate the continue to evaluate uh, heat tolerant rills for fruit and plant characteristics. Once uh, markers and QTLs are identified, 
uh, related to uh, heat related traits. We're going to valid, try to validate those markers. We currently, and we currently are advancing an eight parent uh, magic population. We're uh, currently harvesting F4 seed, which we hope will be very useful in Im improving and boosting levels of heat tolerance beyond what we already have in our, in our best heat tolerant lines. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the tomato breeding staff and for, the hard, for their hard work, and also the many donors who have provided funding to, our, to uh, continue our work. It's APSA, UKA, GIZ, MOST, uh, and, and many others, COA. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, we got in uh, 10 questions up to now. Uh, the first question from Dr. Maesh from Maiko, I save uh, to the discussion with Dylan because it relates to that. Uh, the first question to the tomato uh, talk uh, regards uh, is coming from Alok Paplial and regards uh, greeny viruses. Does greeny virus lead to yield losses also as severe as um, TLCV in severe conditions? Peter, can you comment on that? Yes. Well, I don't think it causes as severe losses as does begomoviruses. But creamy viruses do, uh, I think, they, I, I suspect they do reduce yield, although I have not seen yield loss estimates in the literature yet. But the fact that it causes all of this yellowing, reducing photosynthetic area, uh, it, it stands to reason that there probably is some yield loss, maybe in the, around the 10, 10 to 15 percent range, I would guess. Thank you. Uh, Sachin Kedikar from UPL uh, Limited is asking, what is the present status of greeny virus in India? Well, all I can say is I've seen it there. I, I saw, definitely saw it in IHR fields in southern India. Uh, but I can't, uh, I have not seen an assessment like I've seen for begomoviruses in tomato. So I don't know what the status of creamy viruses and the distribution and even the, the amount of diversity in creamy viruses. So that's an that's interesting question. Uh, Jonathan Cressin from East West Sea Thailand is asking, uh, was there a difference in virus type for creamy virus between yellow and green plants? A difference in? Uh, tita, virus tita. Tita, tita. Uh, oh goodness, that that's a question for Lawrence if, he, <laughs> if he's around. I did. I just know they all tested positive, though. Although I think this year the the titer was lower with the with the green ones. I think uh, the titer was not really measured. This has to be measured in the in the next round. Uh, a question from uh, Liu Ba from HM Clause. Uh, is testing a silk sugar possible to apply on other crops? I believe it can be done on, on other Solanaceae. I know, I, I believe Mohammed was using it on eggplants. Uh, I am not aware that, uh, in peppers, I'm not aware that the resistance to insects is due to acyl sugars. We are using a spectrophotomatic approach uh, to measure acyl sugars. Uh, this should be possible on most plants, and I think definitely on all plants, the chemical analysis of acyl sugars is, uh, is, is possible. It's just more laborious. So the next question is again from uh, Jonathan Cressin, East West Seed, uh, Thailand. And he's asking about the linkage of uh, the insect resistance QTL on chromosome 2, also with Vashel. Did you uh, look into that? This is another fruit size gene. Uh, and it's also on chromosome 2? Yes. Okay, tell me the name of the gene again. W-U-S-C-H-E-L. Um, goodness, I'm, I'm not sure. I... I uh, that's something I need to look into. So the answer is I'm not sure. I need to look into that. And uh, what is the fruit size of uh, the recurrent uh, parent of the insect resistant population? I think this is also a question of Jonathan from East West Sea, Thailand. Right. 
So 3,6,A2C has a fruit weight of about uh, 80 to 90 grams. So the, uh, the, the population mean of the BC3 that we have now is about maybe about a third of the size, third to a half the size of the recurrent parent. Mm -hmm. Yadish from uh, Nongo Seed uh, in India is asking how uh, high is uh, the acyl sugar level that is required to protect against uh, tuta absoluta? That's a good question. I, I, I believe that the threshold for acyl sugar needs to be established for each insect. Uh, we, have, we, uh, we have this idea of, of 10 because of our, our work with uh, white flies, but it may be lower, it may be higher with tuta absoluta. So when, the time when we start working and investigating resistance to tuta, we're going to have to try to establish that, that threshold. And Bankai Patil is asking how to measure acyl sugar content in plant. I think we have answered this already. So there's a spectrophotos uh, photometrical method and uh, we can share uh, the protocol for that. Peter, do you have something to add to that? Uh, no, I think we can share the protocol. The protocol itself was developed by Martha Mutchler and at, at Cornell University. It measures total acyl sugars and we, we have just adopted that method as our own, and that's what we use. Um, Palaram MV is asking, hi, Peter. This is Palaram from Nunhams, uh, India. White fly resistance, uh, are the new materials compared to those from Martha Mutschler? If so, how are they different? I, th I believe that the levels of acyl sugars from, you know, Martha was working with, is working with Penelii-based resistance. So overall, I think the, the levels of acyl sugars in her lines are higher, but the linkage drag problems with Penelia are really tremendous. So she's been working on this resistance for decades. And uh, I think she's making a lot of progress, but it still may be some time before uh, she has lines or varieties that are insect resistant and that are commercially useful. That, so that's the nice thing about working with the Galapagense is that there, it's a much closer, closer uh, relative to cultivated tomato and the linkage drag problems are much less severe. Alok Taplial uh, is asking, how is the maturity of line 3940C? Is it late? Uh, I'd say it's a medium. It's not late, no. So it, it's not really, it's sort of in the medium uh, range of, of maturity. Gurumuri from uh, Namdari Seeds is asking, how is the relationship of TY3 alleles with chlorotic virus and a second chlorotic virus and uh, magnesium deficiency? When he says chlorotic, does he mean tomato uh, uh, chlorosis virus or something else? Here it would be important to have uh, a chat function, perhaps. Um, perhaps uh, we can no. get feedback up the chat function. Does not work? Oh, yeah, it could work. If Gurumi could uh, send us uh, a short message to precise uh, the question. And uh, in the meanwhile, uh, Jonathan from East West Seed is asking, how far along uh, are you with heat stress mapping? Okay. Heat stress tolerance mapping. Heat stress tolerance mapping. Well, there's been a lot of work, uh, mainly through our collaborators. We, the main ones being in Spain at, at Valencia and also uh, National Taiwan University. So they've been working on mapping, especially pollen, pollen traits, pollen viability, pollen number. Uh, they've identified some QTLs. But uh, our first efforts to try to validate some of these QTLs in, uh, in, 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 it was actually in a different mapping population. We didn't find that they were significant. I, so I'm beginning to wonder whether QTLs identified in a specific pop population might be quite specific to that population and may not be widely applicable across other populations. So, uh, that's that's possible. That's something I'm interested to find the answers to. So we'll know more as we start to receive 
in, uh, information on, on QTLs and then validating these markers. Yeah, last question now, I think. Uh, Vito Bocciutki uh, is thanking you for the nice presentation and is asking for any linkages between insects and virus resistance. Um, not that I'm aware of. At least the, the TY genes, one through six, none of them are th that I'm aware of. Are, I, I'm not aware of any uh, TY genes on chromosome two or any QTLs. So I, I, I don't think there's any linkage. So at this point, I would like to thank you uh, for the presentation, for answering the questions, and especially our colleagues uh, from the Breeding Consortium for asking uh, so many interesting questions. There are still 11 questions unanswered, which we will try to answer by, uh, by email. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um,